This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 731, recorded on March 12, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, it is gorgeous outside, 66 Fahrenheit, 19 Celsius. So I, a degree away from doing room temperature uh, lab work outside. And uh, it's just <laughs> really nice. <laughs> it's 18 Celsius here in New York City. Wow. All of, and all the, su- the snow is now gone. It was not gone almost, when we... Almost. When we um, Recorded. Oh, yeah, right. Almost. And my neighbor still has snow. He must have a shaded area. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it is also gorgeous here. It's it's only 60 Fahrenheit, 16 um, Celsius. Well, 61 Fahrenheit would actually be 16. So I guess they're rounding a little bit there. Hmm. Um, and clear blue skies and almost all the snow is gone. We've got a couple little, they're now completely black piles of soot covered <laughs> snow remainder where the snow plows left nice. little bits. Nice. All right. If you want to hear weather now from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Howdy, everybody. <laughs> well, it's not perfect. It is warmer than you guys. We got 79 degrees. Uh, it's cloudy. Oh. And you, you know that I don't do cloudy. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's okay. It's good. And, uh, uh, the snow is gone, and uh, spring is definitely springing this time. The um, uh, the perennials are uh, starting to shoot up green things, okay? So I'm pretty excited about that. So what would be a perfect day? Would be 80 degrees and sunny? Would that be okay? Oh, I'd put it, I'd, uh, 80 degrees is a little, I'd say 75, if we're going to get picky about it. Oh, 80s <laughs> so, yeah, 75 okay. and sunny. That's good. Because if it's going to be if it's going to be sunny and a nice temperature, I'm going to be outside in it and I'm probably going to mm. be moving. OK, and so I can provide the uh, the extra five degrees internally. OK, now this is from someone who spent many years in Florida, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, yeah, and grew up in California in the sunshine. How many years Life, were you in Buffalo? Think, 20? Uh, tw- 12. Okay, so that ne- you never got used to that cold weather, right? Uh, well, yeah, you know, at uh, our, my my uh, my experience now, having experienced a bunch of different climates, is that it takes somewhere between five and ten years to really fully acclimate to mm. a given climate, and then with respect to Buffalo, I think after ten years, uh, it starts to piss you off. Okay. And, um, you know, you get used to it and then you're on the other side in particular, when you start to anticipate moving to Florida, I re- I remember, uh, kind of the last, uh, time I was out on a really cold night thinking, you know, I may not have to do this anymore. Yeah. I, I was going to say that you actually just, you know, paid your dues in Buffalo and now we're getting to reap the rewards. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, there's a flip side to all of this. Uh, it, it does get, pretty warm here during the summer um and you know you you can put on as many clothes as you want what who was it that wrote us and said there's no such thing as uh uh, this must have been some other correspondence twiv related but independent of you guys there's no such thing as uh cold weather just uh uh inappropriate clothing Mm. (laughs) <laughs> okay. So you can, you know, you can always put on more clothes, but you can only take off so much. Yeah, that's okay? right. So yep. uh, t- pay your money, take your choice. Uh, my choice would be San Diego. <laughs> but yeah, but it's I, that's, pretty, that's not happening. It's pretty crowded there these days. You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. what do you want? You want great weather or you want a little elbow room? I, I mean, don't know. you want fewer you know, earthquakes. Even yeah. Austin is getting very crowded, right? Yep, Austin is uh, on the upswing. We got, um, of course, Tesla just moved here, and uh, so, some other big operation is uh, trying to negotiate uh, space here. It's becoming, uh, yeah, it's becoming a hot spot in particular for tech. 
Okay, now that we've pissed off some people for not getting right down to business. <laughs> well, we haven't done a we, we haven't done a weather uh, thing like that for a while. Yeah, I mean, you can tell Gosh, the weather's I, I didn't nice. Even get into my my uh, moving to Massachusetts and discovering that barnacle scrapers are actually called ice scrapers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Barnacle, I mean, I was from, in the uh, hardware store and I saw the barnacle scrapers there and they had a mislabel. It was like, oh, yeah, I guess around here that's what they call them. Yep. I've not lived anywhere for any for 12 years except here. I mean, I went three years to Boston. It doesn't count. You never get used to it. And I've been here in this New York, New Jersey area my whole life. So I'm used. I'm not sure I could move somewhere else at this point. <laughs> I, I, I can't believe I've moved around as much as I have because, you, you know, I don't I don't think of myself as a moving around type. But when I add them all up, uh, did. there's a lot of, lot did. of different places. Yeah. You did. Alan moved around quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but Brian, I, moved around, I just bounced around the Northeast. Brand you moved yeah. around, right? I did. I upstate New York to North Carolina to Boston to North yeah. Carolina to upstate mm -hmm. New York to New Jersey. <laughs> so you think you're hanging around there for a while or you got you got another move in your mind? Uh, I mean, right now, things seem to be pretty good. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, me too. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, maybe downtown, but that's about it. <laughs> All right. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Ebola virus disease outbreak, which uh, there are two of them ongoing in uh, Africa. Uh, in, in, I, I was thinking, you know, there was a big outbreak in 2013 to 2016 in West Africa, the first outbreak in that part of the country. Went on for a while. Many that people. part of the continent. It's a continent, yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, Africa's not a country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got it. <laughs> yeah, the other day I was talking about Africa and I called the the African continent. I was actually quite good about it. Um, but um, I remember that during that outbreak, we ignored it for a while. And on TWIV, we just went our usual thing, ways and someone wrote in and said, we depend on you to understand what's going on. Please talk about the Ebola outbreak. And I thought, whoa, okay, <laughs> this is not just what we want to do. So we did. And that's why in the beginning of 2020, as soon as this pneumonia outbreak started in China, we, we got on it. And boy, that was a big one and a long one. Yeah. We're still on yeah, it. I think that, that, um, that Ebola outbreak was the first time we really went to kind of a, you know, breaking news on uh, not breaking news but uh, you know a news cycle type of yeah let's yeah. do our weekly update and we did the ebola sit reps and and yeah. focused yeah. a little on that whereas in the past it was always you know eh, i read any interesting papers lately um but, but we uh, didn't, that, that shifted uh, us we didn't do ebola every episode for a no, long no, time no, no. right we just did no reports, it, yeah. we've never done it. this pandemic is the first time that we've ever just like dedicated to one thing yeah. for such a length i I mean, I leading up to up to TWIVs, I I think, oh my gosh, shouldn't we do other things? And then once we get into it, it's it's clearly very interesting, and it's going to be interesting for a while. Sure. Um, but uh, we will slowly move towards uh, other viruses. There are a lot of interesting things out there. I've almost forgotten how to look for other virus articles. <laughs> I'm so I, I am looking. I'm very much looking forward to the time when we can have you know the the COVID nineteen sit rep at the top, and then you know go and talk about other cool viruses. Yes, yeah, that'll happen for sure. So anyway, this outbreak uh, began in February, beginning of February. It's, it's happening. There are two separate ones. There's one in the DRC. It's kind of central center of the continent of Africa. DRC is a country, right, Alan? Yes. Yes. <laughs> DRC is a country. And then Guinea, um, Guinea, which Guinea, is uh, West Guinea, West Africa, which is uh, on the West Coast, Northwest Coast, I guess, or West Coast. And that's where the 2013 outbreak was in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. So this is the uh, second one for, for Guinea, right? Yeah, and I think this is what something like the 20th or high teens for DRC. Um, they've had a few yeah. Ebola outbreaks over the years um, going back to 76. Yeah, there have been, what, 30 or more outbreaks, right? Um, this uh, Wikipedia page that you linked in here, the yes. is, list of Ebola outbreaks is really good in this regard. Yeah, yeah, I tried to count them, but 
Every time I scroll and count, I lose track yeah, of where tough. I was. It's around 30-ish. I'll, it, I'll, I'll give it a rip here. But you what ahead. happens with these Ebola virus outbreaks, Ebola virus of course, is a filovirus. It's a negative-stranded RNA virus. Very unusual, filamentous and uh, enveloped with a spike like a protein, which uh, the, the outbreaks don't typically, except for this West African one, they don't go on for a long time. They eventually peter out that the virus does not become a human virus or in, in the sense that it, like SARS-CoV-2 is now a human virus. It spilled over from a bat, went through some changes, uh, and now is a human virus. But the Ebola virus remains a, a zoonotic virus. And, you know, it transmits by close contact with bodily fluids um, and doesn't do the, the airborne respiratory droplet thing. So eventually they peter out. If you do the infection control, you can stop them. They typically start with, so we think the, the reservoir is bats, right? And we, we're, it, yeah, there's, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence pointing to bats for this, but nobody's Africa. completely nailed it down. Mm -hmm. Nobody's found yeah. the virus in bats. In fact, didn't we, Rich, talk about this with da da Dashek? What is, no, not Dashek, uh, Kaizek. In uh, in uh, Galveston, he said, "You know, we have this evidence. It's really hard to get much more. I don't. He didn't think he would. We would ever get much more evidence that it's in bats. And, and just as Africa is a continent, bats are not a species. No, they're, they're, they're not many, species. Not so many. Many species. We don't even know exactly which species of bat this would be in. But you know, yeah. I mean, there is what, what we've got are uh, so you have to go into caves in Africa and." sample bats and it's kind of dangerous because these are dangerous viruses and we have some PCR fragments we have some seropositivity but no one ever has got infectious Ebola virus from bats so that's and, and the numbers are small we don't have huge numbers of seropositive bats or PCR positive specimens but the idea is that each outbreak which has happened mainly in Africa uh, starts with bush meat where someone is either eating a bat or working with a bat, thinking about eating it, and or another animal that has been contaminated by a bat, and you infect yourself. And Ebola we've seen infects, infects other primates, right? Infects it other does. primates. Yeah. Right. So exactly. there's uh, plenty of opportunity for any immediate host. Am, am I correct in recalling that it has uh, really done a number on the gorilla population? That's right. It has, That's right. yes. Right. Yeah. So I think and, prime, and, uh, uh, other primates are like humans. That's a, they're dead-end species. They're not, you know... Reservoir host, they get infected yeah, and, accidentally. And I put in something at the end of our little Ebola discussion here that I read today that gets back to this uh, Ebola as a zoonotic virus uh, question. But I think that that's maybe a more speculative thing that I just saw data on today. So tell us about that. I haven't that seen end. that. Good. Yeah, what, what's that about? Yeah. So um, there has been uh, some discussion of. Sometimes Ebola virus persisting in immune privilege sites in some individuals mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and potentially being spread uh, in individuals from um, who had been infected a while ago. Yeah. Um, and so every so often there'll be sort of Ebola is gone from an area and then it shows back up. Um, and it was noted that in the DRC, um, if you look at the first ProMed um, report of this outbreak, that the first person who uh, was infected was actually the wife of an Ebola survivor. Um, and so there was speculation um, that perhaps in that case, um, this could have been a persistent virus um, that had spread to her. Um, obviously, there's that's circumstantial evidence. Um, and and one does not know, but that was pointed out. And I remembered reading that in that very first ProMed uh, case. And then today, uh, Virological, um, which I think we talked about before, actually released some sequencing information on some isolates from um, the Guinea outbreak. And if you look at the, the Virological post, I'll just read you kind of a quote out of it. Um, so if, when they looked, um, they found that the sequences all clustered with the 2013 to 2016 variants that were in that same area of Guinea. Um, and, um, in fact, it has only 12 substitutions, um, which is far fewer than would be expected if this was in uh, a wild animal species 
between twenty between twenty sixteen and twenty twenty one, um, and so they are sort of sort of hypothesizing based on those sequence data that something similar might have gone on in Guinea. Though again, this is yeah. you know, circumstantial evidence at best. Interesting, um, though. Yeah, yeah. But it's I, it's pretty good circumstantial evidence, actually. I mean, the, it, it is. I, I don't. As, want, I as don't want to scare go. people. And saying, you know, uh, now in people all the time. Right, no. but, yeah, so that's the thing. All the previous outbreaks, this when you do the sequence, you can see it's quite a different virus. Yep, it came exactly. from another. It's interesting. So I think that's one of the things we learned in the 2015 outbreak was that it can the virus can persist in eye, I think, testes, in an infectious yep, exactly. form. Exactly. And we didn't know that before. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, now that we there was this large number of survivors, um, there really hadn't been such a huge number of survivors yeah, before. Yeah. We can start to see, um, and as well as some of the kind of long term sequelae um, right. that yeah. happened that we weren't so sure about before. Well, so and this, it's it's interesting too if the Guinea outbreak came from something like that because Guinea Guinea and DRC. I mean, as Vincent said, they're they're in totally different places. They're not only do they not share a border, they're in completely different parts of the continent. Um, so it's not like I would have expected somebody to have traveled necessarily between the two places or to, you know, to have exported game. Well, it's called bushmeat when it's other people hunting it. Um, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but it, you know, I, I wouldn't expect that much trade to be going on between these two places. But if the Guinea case is from maybe some somebody who was long-term infected, the DRC case is from another independent source. Could just be temporarily coincident. Mm. Yes. Mm. Uh, so uh, the DR situation as of March 6, 11 cases and four deaths. And Guinea, 18 cases and nine deaths. So it's a high case fatality ratio there. Can be up to 90%, I believe. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. They say in the ProMed Mail report... Uh, over 1,600 people have been vaccinated, including contacts of cases, their, their contacts, and health workers. And that all makes sense, right? You do a little kind of limited, modified ring strategy. You don't immunize everyone, although it may not be a bad idea to immunize at least all the healthcare workers. Apparently, the first case in Guinea was a 50... At, people were infected at the funeral of a 51-year-old nurse and she was the first known case. So maybe she should have been vaccinated. Um, but um, that's how you can restrict this. There, there are two vaccines that we have, actually. Uh, I don't know which one they used in this one. One is the Irvibo, which is a VSV vectored spike, which was actually tested during the uh, West African outbreak. And then there is a prime boost vaccine, for both vectored spikes, modified vaccinia Ankara, followed by an ad vectored spike, uh, which I think is made by J and J. In fact, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> I think that's so. uh, it's the other ad twenty six thing. That's right. And yeah. uh, remember, I spoke of Brighton collaboration templates. Mm -hmm. uh, they have right. filled out a template for the MVA ad prime boost. Cool. Uh, vaccine. So, and I believe that's published. So you can get the uh, you can get the details of that. And the other thing I wanted to say, because we always refer to this as Johnson and Johnson, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's actually Janssen. Janssen. Yeah, yeah. It's Janssen, right. yeah. Uh, yep. Which yep. is what I get. I, I get mixed up. They because are a division of Johnson and Johnson. Yes. Well, they oh, were I thought it was the other Johnson. way around. <laughs> they, uh, 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 they were bought by Johnson and Johnson uh, quite a long time ago. Yeah, uh, it's like in the even in, uh, in the I'm thinking the 50s, but I'm not sure. At any rate, quite a long time ago, and I get confused about where where they are because they have uh, roots uh, or uh, interests in both the Netherlands and in Belgium, but I think they're headquartered in Belgium. I get confused, among other things, because the uh, per C6 cells that they grow the adenovirus vectors in come out of the Netherlands, okay, okay? Uh, University of Leiden. Uh, but I believe Janssen is uh, Belgian. Is, uh, should we, we similarly ignore BioNTech, right, when we talk about the right. Pfizer yes. vaccine? When we talk about the Pfizer vaccine, yes. But they are not part of Pfizer, are they? They're just a collaborator, is that correct? I'm not sure how that works. I don't know how that's set up. Mm. 
I, I, but the cool yeah. thing about these big companies, like, you know, I mean, you can bash big pharma all you want, but uh, Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson in particular, the fact that they are global and uh, have so many, man, uh, so much manufacturing capability and research capability globally uh, means that when it comes to manufacture and distribution, uh, they have a huge leg up on mm -hmm. yeah. the, new, the new small companies. That's right. That's why that's why BioNTech partnered with Pfizer. Sure. Uh, how, however, that deal is structured, because right. you know a small biotech company does not want to have to crank out a billion doses of anything tomorrow. Um, whereas for Pfizer, you know, yeah, that's something they can do. Uh, and I'm not sure about all of the politics of this, but uh, am I? I am correct, right? That Pfizer opted not to take up warp speed on its offer for that funding. That is correct. That's right. Right. Pfizer took, because, Pfizer took partly no because funding. then they could structure their yep. trials any way they wanted to. Uh, okay, <laughs> and and do it do it their way, which they know they know how to do this stuff. Not that the others don't, uh, but they were all set to go because of their global presence. Yes, interesting. Yes. Um, and, and I will I will just point out I did Google. Uh, Alan is correct. I was incorrect. Uh, Johnson & Johnson is the parent that yes. owns Janssen, and um, Janssen is in Belgium. Mm -hmm. Belgium. Okay. And this is also why I think uh, Merck is helping J&J &J manufacture some of the, the vaccine. They have Because Merck has huge vaccine manufacturing yes. capabilities. Merck has huge vaccine yeah. manufacturing capability, and they just recently canceled their COVID-19 yeah. vaccine because right. they, they had preliminary results that were... They weren't awful, but they weren't great. And they said, well, you know, do we push this into phase three anyway when there are already a couple of vaccines on the market? Or do we can that and pursue antivirals? And they've got some very promising antivirals in the pipeline. Um, so they canned their vaccines. They've got this vaccine manufacturing capacity. I mean, Merck is a giant in vaccines. Yep. Um, so J&J, &J, I'm not sure the degree to which the... Um, the federal government, the Biden administration nudged this along. Um, there's certainly been discussion yeah, of, yeah. of using Defense Production Act to, to you know, force collaborations like that. But I get the impression J&J &J was very much on board with collaborating, even though these are companies that would traditionally compete in vaccines. The other thought I had about the, the Merck thing, and I think I've talked about this before, and I'm making this up, but... Uh, uh, Growing viruses, which is what's required to make the J&J &J, uh, Janssen vaccine, is something that a lot of these big pharma companies know how to do, okay? Yeah. So I would imagine that tooling up that technology for somebody like Merck would be an easier task than tooling up, say, the mRNA nanoparticle technology, which is a relatively no novel technology. Yes. Now, is it... Isn't it true that J and J is not a big man vaccine manufacturer, but it's Janssen that gives them that capability to develop them? Right. I mean, uh, Janssen is a division of J and J at this point, so okay. yeah, okay. they. I mean, but they and they bought into that a long time ago. They still retain the brand because it was well established, but um, but it's part of the same company. But I, I mean, it's not like Merck, who's, who have made many, many different vaccines, or Sanofi, Pester, they make right. a lot of vaccines. I think J&J, &J, uh, Janssen, you know, they have this ad platform. And I suspect that when they want to make hundreds of millions of doses, it's not easy for them. And that's why Merck came in sure. when they cut a deal Probably. with them. Probably, yeah. yeah. I'm just speculating. I don't know anything yes. about it. <laughs> All right. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about two... Uh, COVID-related topics that we really don't speak about much, and that is kids and long COVID, both separately and together, actually. And um, yeah. Daniel Daniel mentioned that a bit. And the kids was stimulated by an impress article uh, that I found actually last week by Zoe Hyde, who is from the University of Western Australia. Difference in SARS-CoV-2 attack rate between children and adults may reflect bias. Uh, so it's uh, relatively short, but uh, quite nice and clear. Um, and it just, I wanted to do this because, you know, at the beginning of the outbreak last year, so many people said, kids don't get infected, kids don't transmit. It was used as a way to keep schools open or to reopen them and so forth. But as you'll see from this very nice summary, um, there are two flaws. First of all, kids are tested a lot 
less <laughs> than adults. And as the author says, this probably doesn't reflect genuine differences in biological susceptibility. We're just not testing them. And they, they may shed infectious virus for a really short period of time. And so you combine that with not testing them and you come up with flawed numbers. So um, the, the author says, you know, conclusions that children are less susceptible are probably premature. So uh, it, it's quite clear that my, in children, the infection typically results in mild illness and mortality is very low. They, they give the infection fatality ratios for children and adolescents 0.002% and compared to 0.1% for middle-aged adults and over 1% for uh, people over 65 years of age. Now, as Daniel said, and, they, and this author says here, long COVID is underappreciated in the pediatric population. Um, and in fact, Daniel says he's now increasingly running into students, say in school, high school or whatever, who get COVID, very mild, and they go to do their sports, soccer, lacrosse, tennis, and they can't do it anymore because they have some deficit. And he said, that's why we don't want kids to get infectious or one of the reasons why. And they say here that in the UK, and we'll actually look at a, another study of long COVID, five-week prevalence of persistent symptoms may be as high as 12.9% in children 2 to 11 years old compared to 22% for the overall population. So, you know, kids may get mild infections but they're not, they don't escape long COVID. I think it's quite clear. But they, there's, a, there's also this, um, <clears throat> this relatively rare but extremely serious multisystem inflammatory syndrome. That's right. Um, that's, that's horrifying. Um, and that's definitely not something you want to take a chance on. No. And in fact, Daniel mentioned this in his most recent update. And I refer you to listen to that where he said he's, it seems to be changing somewhat. The syndrome seems to be changing in kids in ways that he doesn't quite understand. Uh, so Every anyway, doctor I've heard talk about that talks about how bizarre it is. That it's not yeah, like yeah. the presentation of any other pediatric disease. It's just this really, really weird thing. All right. So she comments that uh, asymptomatic infection is very common. Ch children are twice as likely as adults to be asymptomatic. And the prevalence may be as high as 50% in children or adults, asymptomatic infections. And she, she cites one study of pediatric cases in South Korea. Most of the cases would have gone undetected, but they were picked up by contact tracing because they have so few symptoms that you don't test them, right? Most of the time we test people because they have symptoms. Uh, and they say only 9% of those pediatric cases were diagnosed at symptom onset. So she says, forget about symptom-based testing in kids. If you really want to know... Uh, what fraction are infected, you have to do uh, just surveys, right? She also talks about um, the heterogeneity in, in secondary attack rates. Um, and she says some studies say that children are likely less likely to be infected than adults. Others say they have similar attack rates. Uh, but she says mo many of the studies only test symptomatic contacts. And so that's not good for kids, right? Um, so two, and she said at one study, which she cites serial PCR testing revealed there was only a two day window to identify an infected child, two days. Yeah. I found that part to be particularly compelling, um, in that, you know, because of this issue, we may be missing, even if we yeah. were testing children all the time, we might be missing them That's because right. they yeah. only tested positive for a very brief window. Yeah. A lot of school systems are going to, um, to random testing or, or a portion of the school population testing. They do pooled testing or something like that. Um, but those are those are being done on a subset of the school because they can't afford to do it for everybody every day. And if you only have a two-day window, there's a really good chance you're going to miss some cases of kids sure. who sure. Mm -hmm. just aren't positive anymore. So what's the solution? Well, she says, we could let's look at seropositivity. You get serum from kids and you look for antibodies to the virus. So she cites a number of studies, one in Italy last May, 6,000 people, similar seropositivity in adolescents, 25% and adults, 23 to 26%. Um, 
it, over people over 60, it's actually lower seropositivity. And she speculates that may be because it's called survivorship bias. If you die, they don't have your serum to test, right? <laughs> Which uh, will skew that. In Bavaria, study of 11,000 children and adults. I seem to remember that we may have gone over that last year. They also found this survivorship bias, but no difference in seropositivity between kids less than six years of age and uh, age seven to 18 years of age. And that study was 0.84 and 0.98%. So uh, the serological studies uh, uh, suggest uh, otherwise from, from what we're hearing from PCR. Another study in Brazil, 25,000 people, similar seroprevalence in children and teenagers, 1.3 to 1.6%, and adults, 0.6 to 1.9%. That was in the beginning of uh, last year, and it went up later. Um, and they say, and she says, now you know, you have to think about comparing different populations and how they behave differently, right? So, if you leave, if you start leaving home, you're going to have more likely uh, exposure, right? And they said in China, where we had widespread school closures. Uh, older people are more likely to be infected than kids because kids are staying home. Because they're staying home. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, several prevalent study in Spain, 61,000 people between April and May last year, 3.4% of kids had antibodies compared to 44 to 6%. But she says Spain schools were closed for much of last year. So this could just be the kids are not out getting infected and similar results in Barcelona. So she says these th these studies cast doubt on r recent meta-analyses, which say that children are less susceptible than adults. She, she believes that the data are wrong using to make that conclusion. And she also cites that behavioral and environmental factors, you know, school closing. Um, uh, if your kid's at home, they're not going to be uh, as easily infected as if the adults are out and about. Uh, and then they also have this interesting... Um, uh, it, issue in homes where, um, you know, the, the adults tend to have more contact and they're likely to be transmitting the, the, the infection among themselves rather than among kids. And parents try to shield their kids from infection. Uh, in one study in Singapore, tw children were twice as likely to be infected when their mother rather than the father was the index case. Probably the mother is more intimate with the kids than fathers, right? <laughs> yep. Um, U.S. study found children more likely to be infected if they were children of the index case. So all these factors make it complicated to just make conclusions. Um, the other thing that's very interesting is the um, what we call the um, uh, I forgot the I forgot the word anyway that transmission. Most of the eighteen percent of people account for eighty percent of transmission because apparently right not everyone is making aerosols of the right kind that will transmit um the well, virus and there's yeah. a there's a huge amount of behavioral stuff going yeah. on here um you know so a, so a small percentage of the population will account for the majority of the spread because a small percentage of the population has more contacts than most people uh so the you know the person who's <clears throat> contacting more people is gonna the, the bartender is gonna spread to everybody who comes up to the bar whereas the random patron is only you know going to stand in the corner and drink their beer. Um, so you've got, you've got that effect going on as well. And finally, she said some studies have shown that anal swab is better in kids for detecting infection um, compared to throat swabs. And so she says viral shedding and feces appear to be prolonged compared to respiratory tracts. You know, in the kids, they shed for a short period of time. It may be better. I don't know. I think you're going to have a problem getting those from kids. Um, that is not going yeah. to be implemented at the school level. That's no. just no. not happening. No. Not happening. So, so basically, I, I came out after reading this with uh, recognizing you can't say kids get infected less. Uh, they, they do seem to get less severe disease overall, but they're, they're not immune from long COVID, of course. And I think that um, uh, you, you can't use that as an excuse to open up schools. They're, they're just probably as susceptible as older people are. Yeah. She does a really nice job of looking at all the angles and taking the whole thing apart. Yeah. 
It's yeah, it's yeah, a good she really does. Really, really, really good review. So her, her last sentence, it's likely that children are more susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection than first thought, and they probably play an important role in community transmission. That's important also. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, this or scenario- at least they will, they will if schools are open. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So the scenario where you have kids back in school, they're not vaccinated and the teachers are all vaccinated, you know, the kids could still be infected and, and transmitting. Yeah. So you have to be careful, I think. And I think this points out how, you know, in a, in a newly emerging field, when studies are done, it, you know, one or two studies are not going to give you the answer necessarily. You need to wait till there's more of a consensus. And, and, you know, I think we were all suspicious of this idea that kids don't get infected because we know kids do with everything else, right? Yeah. Well, and this, uh, uh, this happens with, um, to be fair, you know, this has been happening throughout the pandemic with various topics that have come up. Um, the most recent one being the variants. You know, yeah. do we need to worry about these variants? Well, I, and, and my initial reaction was, okay, there's very, very little data here. You know, we're looking at the UK in, in this one variant. It's become more prevalent in one area of the UK. That does not prove that it's some highly transmissible thing that's going to get all of us. But what we see is accumulating data that they're may be a fitness advantage for some of these variants. I'm still not going to say transmissibility because nobody's proven that that's the mechanism. But there are multiple transplants of, of a variant now where you see it overtaking the viral population. And yeah, that bears monitoring. But that's an evolving situation that we need to, if you'll pardon the pun, that we need to you know keep track of. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing where as the data arrive, you need to adjust to to what's going on and this initial thing was oh kids don't get the virus are you sure <laughs> kids don't get the are, have you tested the kids for the virus um and it's really this kind of summarizes a lot of the it's very the, good yeah yeah i think that what, what alan said is is something that i keep coming back to throughout the past year um is sort of a, a way that we can use this to help people think about sort of science in general and educate people on science um i think that a lot of people have learned about science you know that's came from a textbook and so there's there's a magic book somewhere that tells you all the answers um and there there was no magic book that told us all of the parameters of SARS-CoV-2 um that we could have looked at last March and said oh well this is what happens to kids and oh this is what happens in this situation um that's all stuff that we have to figure out by gathering data and making observations and so um you know as we make more observations we get better estimates of what's going on and we better understand things um and so you know this is about getting the data this is not about just us knowing a priori Right. And this yeah, is, of course, that, a nightmare for policymakers who have to make decisions right now. And they're they, they're used to dealing with some ambiguity in information. But when they're say, when, you know, you're saying, well, do masks help? Well, they probably make some difference. I can't put a number on it. But OK, do we have an should I as governor implement an order that everybody's got to wear a mask everywhere? Eh. It won't hurt, right? <laughs> and then, and then you've got this whole political tinderbox around masks, and and now you know we know not a whole lot more about mask efficacy than we did before. We we do know they're probably helpful. Um, you probably ought to wear them. It's probably a good idea, certainly if you're indoors. Um, but the the fact that that took a while to sort out really really caused a lot of problems in making policy. And with the infections in kids, there's this, I mean, I really sympathize with the people who are trying to decide whether to open schools or to what degree, because there is, as Paul Offit talked about, there's a huge cost to keeping schools closed. And this is having a massive public health impact that is, you know, measurable against the toll that SARS-CoV-2 would take if you reopen the schools and at where do you balance that risk? And that's not a scientific question. That's a policymaking question that needs to be aired out in light of the data. Um, but as we're pointing out here, you know, the data, we need to keep going back to them and saying, well, is that right? Do the kids really not get infected? Well, no, they do get infected. So then what do you do with that? So I have uh, I have two thoughts uh, so far on this. First of all, 
um, to me, the notion that uh, kids can uh, spread disease doesn't mean that we shouldn't open schools. Right. What it means is that if you're going to open a school, you can't assume that the kids aren't going to get sick, uh, aren't mm -hmm. going to get the virus and yeah. pass it around. You have to do it with that understanding. That's and right. I think that we know enough about the disease now so that in many circumstances, the, uh, if you take the appropriate precautions, you can do it okay. I think there's, I keep hearing about uh, 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 studies that I can't quote them chapter and verse that come to the conclusion that uh, there's very little, if done properly, there's, uh, you can keep the spread uh, in the classroom down to uh, a very low, uh, if not undetectable level. Um, and on Brianne's comments about science, it's, you know, I think a lot of people, unfortunately, come away from school with the idea that science is about knowing stuff. It's okay? about memorizing. <laughs> yeah. But it's much more about not knowing stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's about trying to figure stuff out, which implicit in that is that you don't know what's going on and you're trying to figure it out. And it's a lot more about being wrong than it is about being right. You know, occasionally you get to be right and that's good. Then you move on and you're wrong again for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the the school is a great point about the schools. I think you got to have testing as part of your strategy, yes. right? And not enough schools do it because yes. for whatever reason, but it's really key to have Money. testing in there. Money yeah. is a big, big reason. Yeah, that's my feeling this. exactly. Is that I was, I was just going to say, you can open schools safely, but that doesn't mean that every instance of someone trying to open a school safely without the right precautions is going to work um you know you need to actually spend the money and do the things to make it safe i've been uh, watching this play out in real time in my daughter's environment at texas state and they seem to have uh, a, a fairly robust testing uh, program going on uh, so my daughter gets tested every week uh, and on top of that uh, she can get tested almost any time if, uh, if she's uh, suspicious of an exposure or something like that, they have a very rapid turnaround time. And that really, uh, they, they don't have any what they call community, if the community is defined as the university, community transmission at Texas State. It's stuff that's being brought in from elsewhere. So We have a very good testing program here at Columbia, both the medical school and the other campus, but it's mm. expensive. Right, they do yep. swabbing. They send the samples to the Broad Institute, and they have told us for one year they're not going to contribute to our retirement plans because of it. Now, I, I'm not complaining because I know, would complain. Columbia University has more <laughs> freaking money than God. They can afford to do this. Well, they're cheating your retirement plan because they want to scrimp on the edge to try yeah, and yeah, pay for this without actually affecting their their portfolio. They are they still the biggest real estate holder in Manhattan? They were at one point. I don't know. They did sell. They're, they're just. Sell them out. I mean, I agree. I understand what you're saying. I just. I, don't I, I will want... cut. I will cut slack to a lot of institutions and and like you know small <laughs> colleges. I really sympathize. They've got budget problems. But at any time I get a mailing from Columbia that donate to the alumni, like, you people do not need my money. No, I, I agree. I think <laughs> that it's uh, something they could have taken. And but I don't want to. I mean, I'm privileged, obviously, so I don't want to <laughs> complain about it. But it costs money. The other thing I wanted to say is this, the idea, I, I totally agree with this idea that science is a flexible field. You learn as you go, but there are some things we do know. And unfortunately, many people have, uh, are new to the field because of the pandemic and they don't bother to read or to look at what we do know. And sure. I just wrote a blog post yesterday about how vaccines work because I went back to the textbook that I co-authored. And you know what? There's a really good chapter on how vaccines work. And it answers a lot of the questions that people have been raising up uh, over because they didn't bother to even look and read something. For example, you know, most human, and we have talked about this, most human vaccines do not prevent infection. 
there's a great example of one that does the, the human papillomavirus vaccine, which is very unusual, but most of the others allow infection. We've known this, but people were debating it for years and for, for a long time about COVID vaccines. I'm sure they're not going to prevent infection. Um, anyway, so that's, I agree, it's flexible, it's fluid, but there's also stuff we know in the textbooks. And if you forget that, then... Well, you know, that's it. When we're do when we forget the past, uh, we're doomed to repeat it, right? Right. Yeah, this is a really important <laughs> point. Is that the stuff? There is stuff that's known, and it's known with certainty, and you can't yeah. disregard it. You can't choose yes. those facts. That's or exactly. choose this is, against this those is how facts. we land a robot car on Mars, right? <laughs> I mean, right. <laughs> if the stuff that we know to be true wasn't, that wouldn't work. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, Alan, now that you mentioned that. I saw a really interesting discussion uh, yesterday. You know, people said, you know, space travel is risky. You know, two shuttles blew up and killed everybody on board. But he said, and, but that's the way air travel was in the beginning. But we did so much of it. We got to know what how to make it work and we improved it. But we can't do all that much space travel. So it's still going to be risky for a while. I, I like that yeah. logic, right? It makes sense. That's, yeah. A lot of the uh, FAA yeah. regulations were written in blood. That's yeah. uh, pretty much how all you know. How do you figure that out? Well, this guy died. You know? Yeah, 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 right. The uh, you bring to mind. Uh, have you guys ever actually seen a shuttle in the flesh? I, at the uh, Air and Space Museum in DC, I saw one. Yeah, right. okay, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. I've seen I've seen a couple, including that one. I think that's one of the best displays. What an amazing machine! It's huge! It's yeah. huge! <laughs> huge! Absolutely <laughs> I mammoth! I know. And you know the the Saturn V is huge, also that put up oh, yeah. Apollo, right? That's yeah. really big as well. Just no, enormous. no. When you go to the uh, this, it's outside of DC. It's right the uh, in uh -huh. Dallas. It's Dallas. Oh, the, yeah. yeah. And they have a big shuttle there, and it's amazing. But I have to say, once the shuttle flew past uh, my window on top of a seven forty seven, right? Many years ago, they were. It was for some event. They flew around Manhattan a few times. And holy crap, just seeing that, it came, went right by my window, actually, and I took a little video of it, uh, and it's amazing. Yeah, it's really amazing. I think, I think that was uh, a sort of a decommissioning final tour. Maybe. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, when they decommissioned those things and distributed them to the yeah. various museums, I seem to recall a flyover of New York. That may have even been the one that wound up in Dallas. Could be. I am you know, so happy. That, I was... I'm so happy about what I picked right now um, because oh, yes. my pick oh, is going to yeah. tie back yes. right to this conversation. <laughs> uh, when, but when they were doing that, I was really hoping they would take at least one of them and make it an artificial reef. <laughs> because that would be the coolest dive site, right? You oh, could would float cool. zero gravity over the cargo bay of the shuttle. Yeah. But that, now that's good. Put them on display elsewhere. Okay. So the uh, all the shuttles uh, were retired somewhere in museums, I suppose, yeah. right? Yeah. They're... Hmm. All right, we have uh, a couple other short things I wanted to chat about. One is uh, consistent with. You know, we'll, we'll be, be back with viruses after these messages from space. <laughs> uh, well, and we, our picks actually relate to this as well. We'll come back. This yeah. is from Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report. Um, oh, but I want to say one more thing. Uh, Daniel mentioned, you know, he was talking about seeing long COVID in young kids. And he said the hardest part is the parents come in and say, but you said it's not serious in kids. And now these suddenly kids are getting long. And, and Daniel said it's really hard to tell them that. You know, well, we were wrong. We didn't know so many yeah. asymptomatic infections would give rise to long COVID. It's tough. Yeah. That's so, folks, besides, speak, besides pol policymakers, that's another job where the uncertainty of science is really, really hard to work with. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Anyway, this is Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report. Estimated SARS-CoV-2 seroprevalence among persons aged less than 18 years, Mississippi, May, September 2020. So it's Following off on the article we just discussed, this is another serological survey done in Mississippi. Um, why? Because we don't really know uh, how many kids are infected. And they say that at the very beginning. We have, as of March 1st, uh, people less than 18 accounted for approximately 11% of the 28 million reported cases. However, they say data uh, are limited. So let's see what we can do. So these are convenient samples of a serum collected at uh, Mississippi Medical Center. And they 
the, the Mississippi State Department of Health got together with the CDC and they said, let's take a look. And they did two different assays for antibodies uh, that interact with, with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And here, here are the numbers. They're quite, quite interesting. So um, based on their seroprevalence, they estimate that um, between um, by mid-September 2020, 113,000 people less than 18 years of, of age in Mississippi might have been infected by SARS-CoV-2 based on their serological studies here, you know, the percent positive specimens. The number of diagnosed cases in that age group, 9,000. 113,000 versus 9,000. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean... They missed a couple. They yeah. missed <laughs> a whole bunch so what that's uh, what's that a factor of almost fifteen? Is that right? Uh, yeah, something like that. And it, I can do the calculation. Yeah, I don't have a calculator handy. Here we go. Um, it's nine thousand, right? Divided by um, what is it? One hundred. One hundred thirteen. One hundred thirteen. So it comes out to uh, seven point nine percent. Rich wants to know the factor, so we have to do it the uh, other way, uh, right? Uh, right. We do. Mm -hmm. Divided by 9,000. 12. It's 12 a factor of 12 and 12. a half, yeah. Um, so, yes, huge. it's and huge. So, it's huge. By the way, the, the way they're doing this is they've, the first of all, a convenience sample means that these are people in the hospital who got blood drawn for some other reason, yeah. for a, any mm -hmm. number of reasons, okay? And they're archived. And they, they assayed... 1,600 people, and then they extrapolated right. from the numbers that they got from that to the whole population. Right. Which is usually what you do. You don't take care from everybody, right? Right. 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 So they say that uh, these, these numbers suggest that cumulative infection rates among people less than 18 years is similar to those 18 to 49 years of age, which would say they're all infected at the same rate, which is kind which of what- lines up well with- all the data from the review that we were just talking exactly. about. Right. Yep. Exactly. And this is exactly what the review said we needed to do. Yeah. 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 We need that. So, you know, be, kids, you have to be careful. And if you think you're not going to get infected, you're wrong. And if you think you're not going to have illness, you're also wrong. You may. And if you think they're not going <laughs> to spread it, you're definitely wrong. And so That's wrong too. So. Please be careful. I mean, I always tell my students in my class who are college students, be careful, you know, be careful. You're not, you're not vaccinated. You're not going to be vaccinated for a while. Be careful. And this is another reason for that. Boy, there's a bunch of other data in here that's just amazing. This uh, table one is just incredible. Yeah. First of all, the seropositivity rate in the uh, 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 individuals, um, less than a year old is even, I don't know how statistically significant this is, but it's higher Yeah. than in the people uh, one to 17 years old. Okay. Uh, male, female distribution is about the same. Uh, Hispanic is over four times the white population Yep. in terms of seropositivity. Uh, black, non-Hispanic, is almost three times the rate. Yep. Yep. Incredible. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Just incredible. And the increase with respect to time is stunning. Yes. Resulting yeah. with something that's uh, a little less than 20%, and that was in September. Yep. Right? Yes. When we aren't even really into this latest surge. No, right. Yeah. And this will be done again, and it will be even more stunning. So It's huge. And I was thinking as I was reading this, kind of along the same lines as what Offit was saying, kind of maybe no wonder uh, we're seeing such a sharp decline. Maybe we really are. Now, this is this is Mississippi, a certain, uh, you know, this is one yes. area. But right. maybe, maybe there's a little bit of herd immunity starting to kick in here in addition yeah, to the vaccine. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, what did we say? 
12 fold, 12 and a half fold. 12 and a half yeah. fold, yeah. yeah. Underestimate. So let's round it off to 10 fold. <laughs> we have 28 million reported cases. Could be almost 300 million. <laughs> Yeah, right? that's Ten most times. of yeah. I mean, I'm sure, it's not, <laughs> I'm sure it's not the same in every part of the U.S., so that's no, right. flawed, but that's what we're still, looking at. Still, it's a way to think about it. I, I agree. I think that's what, what Offit suggested, that we are probably reaching it through a combination of vaccination and, and uh, natural infection, which is underestimated, yeah. So once again, this is a MMWR paper that's freely accessible. It'll link all will the be papers in the show we're talking notes. about today. Yeah. And, uh, and MMWR, once again, we say this every time it's worth saying again, is a great read. Yes. And anybody, you don't have to be a scientist. You can read this and understand it and the charts are good. It's all right there. Yep. And you are paying for this folks. Yes. It's your, your tax dollars being put to good work. So check it out. And you know, if, they have other things besides infections, if you're interested yes. in other kinds of <laughs> outbreaks or diseases uh, as well. All right, one more thing. Uh, this, I guess I came across this through Daniel's update uh, last week. This is an update on long COVID prevalence from the UK. Uh, from, what is the ONS, Alan? ONS. ONS. Uh, oh, I gosh. looked that up and now I forget. Uh, yeah, I, th I feel a, like I knew this a, at some point. Well, something like it's a UK thing, something like oh, the Office of National Statistics. That's exactly what it is. Yes. Okay. All right. So January, the, the ONS published its uh, latest estimates of long COVID uh, using data from 9,000 respondents to a coronavirus infection survey. So that if people tested positive, they would give them a survey and say, here, fill this out. Um, and so... They they asked them in this case about um, symptoms. If they, have they had certain symptoms for a long period? And twenty two percent of respondents were still reporting at least one symptom at five weeks after infection, and almost ten percent still had symptoms at twelve weeks. Now, what are these symptoms? The most common ones: fatigue, cough, headache. Loss of taste and or smell, myalgia, and females slightly higher prevalence at five weeks than males. Prevalence greatest among those in the 35 to 49 year age group, 26.8, followed by 50 to 69, 26.1, 25 to 34, 24.9. But of course, they have a paucity of kids in this data because they're not tested enough, right? Right. Yeah. That's a lot of people at four months, at uh, 12 weeks. Three well, months, and this, right? this graph of the age distribution um, and the percentages is really disturbing for a few reasons. I, well, first of all, the 70 plus group, I'm assuming that's short because the people who would have gotten long COVID in that group just died. Right. right? That's mm -hmm. the high risk death group. Um, but the, the curve peaks in the 25 to 69 age range, which is peak working productivity years. Yeah. So what we're looking at here is a graph of massive economic damage in addition to personal damage from people who would be out working and now they're, at least some of their activities are curtailed in some way because they've got symptoms of COVID lingering week after week. So they do have the age two to 11 years. They have, looks like about 12% yeah. have lingering symptoms, five weeks. Yeah, um, I, I think one of the things I really like is after that figure, they have a table on study limitations. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they point out some some things that they their, their limitations. And, and the thing that I really like is that they point out that this only covers um, some symptoms that could be associated with long yeah, COVID. Yeah. So they didn't ask about some of the other symptoms like the cognitive symptoms um, that people have been reporting. And so this may be an underestimate because all symptoms aren't being captured here. And, and I love in that table how they do the direction of bias. Yeah, of yeah, down, yeah, yeah. So this would affect it downward. This there, are, there are a couple of things that would affect it upward, like they don't have data on the severity of symptoms. Somebody has yeah. some very mild symptoms. That still would have counted. It would have biased the data upward. But there are a bunch of things that would bias the data downward as well. 
And and this survey only covers private households, so they, they don't yeah. get anybody in a communal establishment, you know, students or prisons or anything like that. And that could be a significant addition to it as well. So I think we're underestimating this, unfortunately. And this could be, uh, I mean, to me, this is a huge surprise in in this pandemic that you have this long yeah. COVID, right? And I think it's potentially a time bomb with so many people infected. They could have really learned long-term issues, which affect, of course, their health and their ability to work, but also the healthcare system, right? It's going to mm -hmm. be yeah. incredibly stressed by this. Wow. So one of the things I think about <clears throat> in considering this is that we've had this conversation for a long time about how SARS-CoV-2 could just be uh, another uh, common cold coronavirus that is uh, mm. new to the population and equilibrating with the population. This would indicate that that's not the case. No, oh, that's right. Because uh, I think that's if there right. were such a thing as long COVID with those other common cold coronaviruses, we'd know it. Would we? Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, yes. I don't know. I mean, let's think about the, the question of those other viral illnesses leading to long-term sequelae, like the MECFS stories. Yeah. 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 And, okay. and if you look at the historical timing of when we think those earlier coronaviruses came in, I mean, most of them came in way, way back. Right. And somebody having a loss of taste or smell in the Middle Ages that yeah, well, all right. You know, everybody's got something. I got my smallpox scars. I've I lost an ear in that battle. You know, so yeah, yeah. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be noted because uh, the background level of of other casualties was so high. Right, but, but I think not, Rich's argument is that everybody is still getting those common cold coronaviruses now, and yes, we're not children. getting long, long right. OC forty three. Yes, right. Okay, so that that. I would agree with, um, but it, it that may be a factor of co-evolution of the virus with the humans. Could be. I'm uh, and, Rich, from now on, I'm blaming the fact that I'm tired on long-term OC43. <laughs> OC43, yes. <laughs> yeah. so, well, uh, Vincent, you skipped over <laughs> one of your links here when we were talking about estimating what the real um, oh, yeah. uh, burden of COVID is in the population. CDC has its own estimate which is somewhere between the actual numbers they have and the crazy numbers that were maybe not so crazy that we uh, were yeah, talking right, about. Right. Okay. And they're estimating, uh, they're, you know, this is an attempt to take into account that this is an attempt to, uh, give a, a real number based on uh, what, uh, they presume is an undercount and yeah. their, their, their assumptions are that, only uh, about half of the hospitalizations are reported and only yep. about one in four of the symptomatic illnesses are reported mm -hmm. and one in almost five of total COVID infections reported. So their estimate is 83.1 million total infections at this point. And they break it down. That would be 25% of the population. That's mm -hmm. still a big number. It is. That is a big okay? number. Okay, yeah. and that's probably, you know, based on what we've discussed, an underestimate. If you look down at their breakdown age-wise, uh, it's apparent relative to the discussions that we just had that their estimate underestimates the uh, infection of the children because they've yeah. got them yeah. down for 3 million infections from 0 to 4 years and uh, 14 million infections hmm. from 5 to 7 years. Okay, 15, and, yeah. uh, and that's likely to be underestimated by four or five fold in the youngest group there. Yep. And the total under 17 is probably underestimated relative to the older age groups. So their estimates are probably even low. Yep. Yeah. And, and you know, there's a, there's a pretty big range in these estimates. And it strikes me that they do this every year with influenza, right? Yeah, because we never quite know how many influenza infections or related deaths there are, and they do the same kind of estimation, and you get a range, right? So it's interesting. They're used to doing this. Now oh, it's amazing how underestimated. So they're thinking eighty-three million. I, I'd guess at least a hundred million. Yeah. So now almost a third of the population, and that that might say why the infections. And that in some doesn't count how many how many people have been vaccinated now. Right. Um, Oh, that number was just 
up. They they ten percent. Ten percent. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Okay, Fully so if we got thirty percent infections and ten percent uh, vaccinated, there's going to be some overlap there. But now we're getting up towards forty percent at least. Okay, and at that point, as is pointed out in one of the articles I read recently, herd immunity is not black yeah. and white. It's not like right. you go up to say, it's not like you you're full pedal to the metal up to seventy percent, and then all of a sudden it all shuts down. Okay, it's going to be gradual. Uh, the the higher the percentage of the population that's experienced uh, infection, uh, the spread's going to start to slowly uh, decrease. Fascinating, yes. in a tragic sort of way. Well, yeah, yes, it's tragic. Hmm. All right, thank you for uh, pointing that. I forgot to look at that. Right. All right, let's do some email. Uh, let me see. I will take this short first one. Martin writes, Dixon's Sandman rendition was brilliant. A cappella isn't easy. Who knew Vertical Gardens and Victor Borgia st quality and style, style entertainment? Isn't Pearls Before Swine Matthew 7 6? Isn't it? Another brilliant episode. Keep them coming, Martin. I don't know. I don't know anything about that. Uh, uh, yeah. So I, uh, I spent some time on this. First of all, yes, Dixon's Sandman was brilliant. Uh, yeah. And he, I might, no, uh, he's got good pitch. Okay. Because <laughs> that introduction, the intervals in the introduction are not easy. I couldn't do it uh, just on the spur of the moment. And he was, uh, he started and ended in the same key. Okay. So you got, you got it, Dixon. So do you guys know who Victor Borga is? Yeah, 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 I do. Okay, good. Because if you don't, you need to look up some Victor Borga videos. <laughs> sure. He was a comedian, okay, who did his comedy with a piano. He also was the guy who did this phonetic punctuation where he had different sounds for different punctuation marks, like a comma was, <laughs> right? Yes. An exclamation point was, <laughs> Okay, and he would read these things and do all the phonetic punctuation. It was fat. It was hilarious. And yes, uh, Matthew seven point six in the New Testament. I looked it up. Uh, cautions against uh, throwing pearls to swine. Okay. Uh, and the Wikipedia uh, uh, take on that is that people have been puzzling over the meaning of that for a long for for centuries. Um, uh, and come away with uh don't uh waste your uh precious things on those who are undeserving or on situations that are undeserving something like that all right alan can you take the next one Sure. Trevor writes, Hi, Team Twiv. I'm just a community pharmacist from the city of Sunshine, Dauphin, Manitoba, Canada. Today, it's a brisk minus 37C or minus 34.6 Fahrenheit. Unfortunately, due to global warming this year, I don't think we'll hit minus 40 where Celsius and Fahrenheit converge. I've attached a pic of my son demonstrating deposition or desublimation. This happens when you throw boiling water into cold, dry air, and the water vapor goes straight from a gas to a solid. And this is a great picture. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I recommend <laughs> TWIV to anyone who will listen to me. The most fun recommendation was to my dad, a retired physicist and metallurgist. Despite taking no biology, let alone microbiology, on the way to his PhD, he is really enjoying the podcast. In fact, when my sister, just a physiotherapist, called him to say she got a rash after her Moderna shot, my dad told her, don't worry, Daniel Griffin said that is most likely the seven-day itch. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's my actually now about, known, known, known as Moderna arm. Moderna arm, okay. <laughs> Uh, my question is about potentially getting many vaccines at the same time. Our local docs are being told by public, public health not to give another vaccine 14 days prior to a COVID shot and not for another 28 days after the final COVID shot. Daniel Griffin said a similar thing, but said it was a soft recommendation. My memory from vaccine training years ago was that a person could theoretically get hundreds of vaccines at the same time and still have them all work against their appropriate infectious agents and not harm the patient. From an immunology and effectiveness standpoint, is there any reason not to give other vaccines like Shingrix close to a COVID shot? How many vaccines could theoretically be given to one patient at a time and have them all still be effective? 
Thanks, Trevor. And I am going to turf this to Brianne. <laughs> so um, in terms of kind of theoretical immunology, you could give many antigens at the same time, um, many vaccines at the same time, and still have them be affected. Um, it has been sort of noticed that some vaccines, when given together or given at certain doses, don't seem to work as well. Um, that's and that seems to be a vaccine to vaccine specific thing that people you know have have seen but the theory is that you could do as many as as you wanted um i i don't know this for sure but i might guess that a reason why they were spacing shingrix away from the covid vaccine is just so that you don't go through a whole bunch of side effects all at once um because that's one that i've heard has some side effects associated with it um, but I I don't know. Um, but in terms of the theory, I can attest to that. <laughs> in terms of the theory, um, you should be able to give, you know, a huge number of vaccines, a huge number of antigens together, and be fine. And, and I can now attest to the to the uh, Moderna side effects. Um, I, I got my second Moderna shot on Tuesday, and Wednesday was was rough. I'm fine now, but um, the uh, some of the bacterial yeah. vaccines have many components in them yes. right over yep, 10 they do uh, yeah and uh they're they've experimented with rhinovirus vaccines with many many different serotypes in them um so i i, I, yeah, this, I think to me th this recommendation comes under the heading of abundance of caution yes seems to me yeah. and uh, I, I think this is and i this would is say because these it, vaccines are new yeah and so so to me, although they ask you on the on the, when you're signing up for the vaccine, if you've been immunized recently, I don't know that they would uh, necessarily reschedule you if you hadn't. And I would certainly uh, get the vac get the coronavirus vaccine when you can. Yep. Um, and but at the same time, if you're due for your Shingrix vaccine and you have options for scheduling that, you might schedule it at least two weeks away from the COVID vaccine. But if you can get the COVID vaccine, uh, get it. Yeah. Do you want the line? Oh. Yeah. Don't throw away you, your shot. Don't throw away your shot. All don't right. Maybe, you know, the guy, Miranda, lives right up here. I'm going to email him and say, you want to come down and sing that for us? Just uh, yeah. five Whoa. minutes. Oh, wow. That'd be Please. great. I bet he'd do it for us yeah. because we're a public service. I gotta, yeah. I gotta find his contact. Hey, which he might not want to come in here, but he could zoom he's probably in. Probably got, he's yeah. probably got six layers of agents, you yeah. know. But maybe not. Um, Brienne, can you take? You the got next? Tony Fauci on the show. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sure. apparently he goes on anything, right? <laughs> yeah, like, right, right. <laughs> uh, Brienne, John writes, doctors twiv. A friend up in Missoula posted this from a newspaper up there attached. Lunacy, all right there in black and white. We know the structures of the avian flu and coronaviruses in molecular detail, but sure, let's tell people that COVID is just rebranded seasonal flu. Best regards, John. In a currently cloudy, rainy, historic Braddock where it is 57 degrees Fahrenheit, 13 Celsius, coming off of yesterday's sunny 6116. I got my first Moderna jab Monday at a clinic just eight blocks of away. Hooray! Um, and he has this image that is from a newspaper and it is really upsetting um, yeah. about no more, no more, no more lockdowns, no more mandates, no more lies. Um, and it, it's really unfortunate that this is still happening a year later. I'm yeah. surprised this even got published. I, I hold the paper responsible for this. This is misinformation. Yeah, it someone is. hijacked the normal flu season, renamed it COVID nineteen, and terrorized the world. No, why would it, why would anyone do that? And who would believe them? For God's sakes, <laughs> it's crazy. And then I wonder. So they're going to have a rally. This is somewhere in Montana. Yeah, oh, let's yeah. not Hamilton. let's not publicize it. <laughs> Hamilton, Montana, which is a reasonable place. You know, I've been there. <laughs> oh well, Rich, can you take the next one? Josh writes, hello, Twiv doctors. I want to start by thanking all of you for the great work you've been doing during a pandemic. Simply providing real information is so valuable. You have no idea how much it's meant. I realize this, uh, this isn't this week in vaccine logistics, but California's vaccine rollout has been a complete fiasco. My friends and colleagues have all been asking for months when the vaccine is coming. Uh, asking me because I keep up with TWIV. I always say you need to be patient. They believed me for a long time, but they don't believe me anymore. Uh, they think it's never really coming. 
that the companies and government are just making up the numbers that no one has a real plan. After months of this, I don't believe in it either anymore. Like waiting for Godot, we will always be waiting, hearing, oh, it's coming, and it will never actually materialize. I wish I didn't feel like this, but I can't come to any other conclusion after the incompetence shown by everyone involved. Most of the states are now saying, screw it, and just reopening anyway. Now I honestly believe that by the time we become eligible for it, it will not exist in any real numbers, and the government will say, oh, you don't need it now anyway. This pandemic has not only broken our economy, it's broken my faith. Thanks, Josh. And um, I think it's so sad, uh, is isn't this, it? Is this your add-on yeah, here? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I found an article about what's going on in California, right? I mean, they've got 9% of the people fully vaccinated, which is basically the national average, right? But it's a big state, yeah. so I can understand that a lot of people are left out. I mean, this article in the LA Times says they're going to shift their vaccine priorities to the neediest people, right? The lowest 25% of the zip codes, uh, you know, the poorest zip codes. And apparently wealthy people have been getting preferential vaccination. I don't know if that's true. Maybe that's part of the issue. I just feel it's very sad, Josh, that you guys are giving up. And I don't think it's true that they're going to say you don't need it anyway. No. You're going to need it. This no. virus isn't going anywhere, right? Anybody have some insight? No. Maybe, Alan, do you have some insight? I, I have a little bit. But so, all right. So here's my story of annoyance. Um I, I mentioned I got the Moderna vaccine. The reason I got the Moderna vaccine, I didn't, I did not expect to get this shot until at least next month because I have no risk factors and I'm not in the, you know, not in the age group or anything. Or and I, I don't, I hardly ever get out of the house, right? So, why would I be in line? Um, and then our our town was setting up to do vaccine clinics, and this is part of a process that has been in place for 20 years, where as all over the country, many many states have this. Um, localities have an infrastructure to deliver vaccines during a pandemic. All right. Did anybody know this? This is actually something that's for real part of emergency no. management. And they'll have they'll have a few people scattered around, usually in the like the fire departments and paramedics or whatever, who go to recurrent training on setting up a vaccine clinic. And so the the town, my town, many towns in Massachusetts, many towns around the country have they, the way they do it is their annual flu clinic is sort of the drill for this. So it keeps them, you know, up to date and, and all that. And they, they do a flu clinic every year and that lets them test out their procedures. And so they're all geared up to do this for the COVID-19 vaccine. And about uh, two months, month and a half ago, um, I, I, saw on the town website, we, we want volunteers to help staff our clinic. We're going to scale it up bigger than we usually do for the flu clinic. We're going to, um, you know, we'll need volunteers, not only who can give injections, but people who can who can act as receptionists or drive vans for people who don't have transportation. I mean, they they were really working this. Like, we, we hope to be able to vaccinate 500 people a day, right? So I said, yeah, sure. You know, this is a cause I believe in, and I've got the time I can I can go spend a couple of four hour shifts doing this. So sure, I volunteered. Um, and the next thing I heard from them was, all right, we want all the volunteers to get the vaccine first. Um, I was like, okay, I hadn't really expected that to be part of the deal, but I'm thrilled it is. That's a great, uh, you know, great bonus. Um, so I'm there for that. I signed up, I went, I got my first shot and it was shortly after the first shot that the governor of Massachusetts said, you know what, this whole infrastructure that we've we've been maintaining for 20 years, spending millions of dollars training people to maintain with the local clinics that know their local areas, we're not going to do that. We're going to do, we're hiring an outside contractor. We're going to spend millions of dollars to have this outside contractor set up mass vaccination sites at seven places around the state. And there's one at a at a shopping mall, which is obviously not getting a lot of foot traffic these days. Um, that's about I don't know, 20 minutes up the road from me. Um, and the, I think the reason they did this was because it helped them get the vaccine numbers up faster, right? It's quicker to inject, 
a thousand people a day at a mass site than to distribute it to all the individual towns where they're going to do smaller clinics. So now the town clinics that were gearing up to do this are not going to be doing it. Hmm. Right. So then wow. the people, the volunteers are sitting around. They got in, in my town alone, which is a small town, they got four. You just went mute. Uh, you just went mute, Helen. You just went mute. You must have hit something. <laughs> Helen. The last we heard is they went, they got four. <laughs> uh, you, you just went mute, uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Maybe so the cat, he, uh, <laughs> the cat stepped on it. Blame so the while cat. he's fixing that, I'm looking at the New York Times vaccine tracker, which is uh, actually pretty good. And uh, the state with the most vaccinations in the U.S. is the uh, highest percentage of the population vaccinated is New Mexico with 27%. Uh, California is number 32, tied with several other states at 19%. So, uh, you know, I, I, I understand that Josh is really frustrated and it's too bad that he's really frustrated, but I agree with you. You know, I hate to just double down and say, be patient, you know, but I can't say much more than that. I try not to lose faith. Um, cause you know, it's, uh, obviously a complicated and difficult process uh, through, through the whole thing, supply, distribution, um, administration, everything. And, uh, uh of course okay. there's going to be a lot of variability. <laughs> Looks like he doesn't hear us. <laughs> okay. Now I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. yes. Yep. Oh, geez. It's okay. No worries. All right. So, so now because they'd given people first doses, the state was at least following through on second doses on schedule. Yeah. Um, so now we have a bunch of volunteers. We have a, a, at least 100 volunteers who've been fully vaccinated who are ready to staff this vaccine clinic that is now not going to happen. Um, and that's the kind of thing, multiply that by 50 and you've got what's going on. Well, maybe not by 50. I think there are some states that actually have stuck to a consistent plan. But I, I know from uh, Maryland, they've had a lot of jerking people around there um, just because my family members have dealt with it. And, and apparently California, they've been making it up on the fly and saying, oh, we're going to do it this way. No, we're going to do it that way. Um, and that is absolutely the worst way to handle this. I mean, whatever you're doing, even if it was slow, stick with it so that at least you can come up with timelines and tell people stuff that's going to turn out to be more or less true. Otherwise, you end up with something like this, which is a, which is a really sad email from Josh, yeah, who I know. was, I mean, has destroyed his faith in the whole public health system. And Josh, I'm sorry. Um, and And I'm with you. You know, it hasn't destroyed my faith in the whole system, but... This is this has really been a, a disappointing rollout. Alan, in the future, do you think uh, the, 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 for having a a pandemic plan, do you think the federal government should run the vaccination, not the states? Um, well, both really. So what what we need is a consistent plan. And as mm. I say, for twenty years, there's been this system. This dates back to the anthrax attacks in two thousand one. Right. Yeah, and yeah. unfortunately, a lot of that system then got geared around the, the mushrooming biodefense industrial complex and their obsession with anthrax, which is not the biggest public health threat we face. Right. But what came out of that was things like this local vaccine clinic strategy, which is something that you can maintain on an ongoing basis. And it's one of the it's one of those rare examples in public health where, at least in many places, it was maintained on an ongoing basis, right? Mm. So the big yeah. thing in public yeah. health is that something happens and then something gets done and for a couple of years, it's great. And then, oh, you know, nothing's happened in a couple of years. Let's cut the funding to that and put it into some other pet project. Um, whereas we had pieces of this infrastructure um, that that were there. And, and I think a big benefit of, of that is that by handling? <laughs> no, that's what happened before. Um, um, by by handling these things at the local level, you get people who 
understand local issues. Hmm. And delivering a vaccine in my little town in Massachusetts is going to be very different from delivering a vaccine in Washington Heights in New York City, which is going to be different from Queens in New York City, which is going to be different from San Diego. Um, And so I think I think completely centralized control, which I would describe as the Chinese model. Right. That's. Mm -hmm. That's effective if everybody's on board with completely centralized control and and you can implement that. But that's not the way we do things here. Yeah, and, I, and I think we need a mix of a consistent federal plan that is then coordinated down through the states to the local level. And then when everything goes to pieces and we actually need to implement it, try to stick with the plan. You know, even if it doesn't seem like it's working so well at first, make minor modifications. Don't throw the whole thing out and say, oh, no, we're going to do it this way instead. Yeah. The problem is, Alan, if go ahead. I was just going to say, I really like uh, what Alan was saying about the importance of kind of the knowing the conditions in your local area and the Mm. differences between the different local areas, especially because we know that with vaccines, there is sort of this importance of kind of trusted messengers and having someone who is going to actually be able to communicate with members of the community to make sure that they understand what's going on. And, and that would really allow for better sort of community interaction. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a a great example of that is there was a vaccine, a a lot of discussion around um, African-Americans not having trust in the whole medical Mm -hmm. system for, for excellent reasons. Um, And yet uh, there was a vaccine clinic set up in Washington, DC that had a huge turnout of African-American patients in in high risk groups it was sponsored by howard university Mm. right yeah it's a trusted institution in that community and that's the kind of thing i mean you're not going to get that with a purely centralized system but if you have a federal system that says okay localities set up your systems around what you know to be the the local needs then you'll end up with these these types of community trusted messengers oh ms allen if you have if the current administration makes a plan then the next one that is a different party will throw it out because they don't want government meddling, right? Not necessarily. What you need to do is build a system that is that is ingrained enough in the individual states and customizable enough mm-hmm. that Texas can say, we're going to do it Texas's way that just happens to be in line with what the federal plan is, yeah, got it. Um, but you can, you can spin those things. And if you have local, um, you know, local stakeholders yeah. who are going to say, well, you know, we, we've trained our paramedics to do this. We, we want to do it this way. Then those people are going to fight for it. Understood. Okay. All right. Well, let's do another round. Sorry, that was a bit of a soapbox. That's okay. There, but <laughs> no worries. I asked you, I asked you for your uh, thoughts. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, Brian writes, mask soliloquy. Twiv, to be or not to be, that's the mask question. Is it nobler to suffer the slings and arrows of contagion or wear a mask against its spread and thereby end it? The last research was done in China and Hong Kong a year ago, and he gives some references for that. N95s intercept virus, but they aggregate on the mask surface. Institute of Medicine reported this a decade ago. Mask movement, especially removal sheds. N95s were used where and are being used, reused in hospitals. Also, most cleaning methods reduce electret charge, the method used to trap virions in the mask matrix. Hey, look, the word virion pops up. <laughs> I, Institute of Medicine and others recommend wearing a second mask over the N95 in high transmission environments. Hard to do. About masks in restaurants. It's physically impossible to eat, drink while wearing a cloth or surgical mask. Breathing does emit virus if one's infected, but it's a fraction of what gets shed when talking or laughing. Talking loudly is equivalent to singing, according to Chen at our reference four. So when people demask to eat, the real risk comes when they do what people go to restaurants for. Have a good time. (laughs) I have a conflict of interest as an inventor. And an inventor, I patented a butterfly mask that goes over N95s to absorb some pathogens without causing discomfort. It folds off and fits in a bag for cleaning disposal and to test as a biosensor. Also invented, but open source, mask on a stick, which restaurants can put at a place setting. Customers use it when talking, especially to the server. 
Still, I panted the first in Japan and mask on a stick may end up in Asia, too. I see you. So it's in front of your face, but you don't have to have it on, right? That the idea? Oh, okay. I get it. Yep. I'm picturing Good. it's like one of those Victorian um, masquerade party masks, yeah. you know, yeah. that yeah. only you That's hold right. on your face. And now back to a, a little sonnet. Americans, we just don't do masks. This country puzzles the will. Its native hue of intelligence is sickled over with the pale cast of anti-intellectualism. Apologies to Will. Thanks to Twiv, Brian. And I, I presume William Shakespeare, right? Yes, Hamlet. Yes. Very nice. Uh, I think uh, these uh, are... My wife, I just have to say this. My wife uh, had a crossword clue recently that was Hamlet's backup plan. And the answer was <laughs> not, not to be. Not to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Not to be. Very good. <laughs> I think these are good points about masks, yes. Uh, and this mask on a stick sounds like a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Alan, could you take the next one? Sure. Suzanne writes, Hi, Vincent. I found your podcast in spring 2020 and have been listening to every episode since that time. I'm an education researcher and have been enjoying delving into virology and learning new things through your podcast. As so many others have said, our dogs are certain the winners are certainly the winners of this pandemic. First, because they're, we're home with them almost all the time, and second, because of the longer walks, so I can listen to tw more Twiv. My question today is silly and quite tangential, but I'm asking anyway. Please, it's about the photo icon that appears when I listen to your podcast in my car. At first, I thought perhaps it was an older photo of you, but then I looked at photos of you online. I noticed that you seem to have straight hair and darker eyes, while the person in the photo has curly hair and lighter eyes. I've attached a picture of my vehicle screen so you can see the photo too. Perhaps other listeners have the same image pop up, and it's not just my Toyota that displays it. Please let me know if it's you in the photo or if you happen to know why this is the picture that shows up whenever I listen to Twiv in my car. Many thanks for your excellent <laughs> podcast and all the work you and your colleagues put into it. And I... Who this is isn't this big guy? enough for me to tell it's, who this it's is. It's not me. It is not me, clearly. It's a rock star, it looks like to me. Yeah. Uh, and I have no idea why it's showing up. But if you... Normally, the Twiv icon would show up. I don't have my picture in there at all. So I don't know yeah. why that is. If anyone else knows about this, please let us know. Um, none of you folks have a car podcast player, I presume, right? Uh, well, I, I have a, you know, I play the podcast on the car system now and then, or at least I have in the past. And I remember, you know, stuff coming up about Twib, but not this image. Yeah, I, my wife's be. car has a screen on it that might show something i'll, I'll have to it's a honda so I'll, I'll have to ask her if um if she can load up the podcast and try uh, i that. just I know she this is look, probably related to something else you've listened to uh suzanne because that's yeah. not what i put in there no i it's have no weird. idea I'm, I'm i've blown this up i have no <laughs> I, I idea know who it is brianne do you know who this is i i my brain is telling me that it looks familiar but i can't place who it is it's a kind Gosh, of scary that does looking look familiar. Dude. Yeah, I mean, he's not Vinny, yeah. though. He's not Vinny, for sure. Uh, uh, but I don't know. He looks a little spacey, I think. Yeah, I <laughs> he agree. He does. But, uh, yeah, that's, I just, anyone else know about this, let us know. <laughs> he looks a little like Vincent Gallo. Who's Vincent Gallo? A filmmaker. No. Oh. Um, don't know. I don't know. Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Heidi writes, Dear Vincent and others, if you care to share. <laughs> I among the many dog I am among the many dog walking Twiv fans, but I also listen to Twiv while I draw and cartoon. I often find myself wanting to convey my enormous gratitude to the scientific and medical communities for all they have done for us throughout this pandemic, but it is impossible. This amateurish caricature featuring my favorite scientific podcast host will have to suffice. For no particular reason, I have included you in the attached Jeopardy scenario, my tribute to the late Alex Trebek. You are playing the rapper Killer Mike of Run the Jewels and Marie Antoinette. Thanks again for all that you and the TWIV team do, Heidi in Montana. Uh, this is a, a great caricature. I just think it's a riot, and I don't know who Mike, Killer Mike is, but I hope 
He seems to be pushing me out of the way. <laughs> it's funny. And Marie's hair was that big? Is that right? That that is I Marie's that, hair. Yeah, I think that was the style. Wow, it's, it's nice. She's high. kept her head. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, Rich. One more. Uh, okay, I'm uh, I'm distracted here, trying to <clears throat> do an image search. On, <laughs> That's um, funny. <laughs> I'm up to uh, Lainey. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Twiv team. Here's my quote for the week. Prior proper PPE prevents piss poor pandemic performance. Excellent. This is adapted from the original seven P's quote. Prior proper planning prevents piss poor performance. Rumored to have originated uh, from the military. I have attached a photo of a vaccine pin that my employer gave me gave to me, purchased from DescentPins.com, the combination of being fully vaccinated, having access to adequate PPE, and listening to your podcast allows me to feel prepared to handle the challenges of this pandemic. Thank you for all you do. I look forward to each and every one of your episodes, especially the Dr. Griffin uh, clinician updates, and Lainey is a physician's assistant in Knoxville. I think and, it says... Uh, has a, uh, it says... I forgot. I can't see things. Think. Oh, think science and the shape of a vaccine. Yeah. No, I've thanks. Thanks, before. science. Oh, thanks, thanks, science. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Very nice. It's a lovely pin. Uh, I don't know about this descentpins.com. It looks interesting. Hmm. Descentpins.com. Uh, I get I a just, lot of ads from them. Oh, hmm. yeah. These are nice pins. And there's a vaccine, a bunch of vaccine pins. Yeah, there's a vaccine collection. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Excellent. This could be a pick of the week. Yeah, thanks, Science. I'm a vaccine booster. I'm vaccinated. Ah, oh, very cool. Earrings, pins. Cool. Good stuff. Thank you for vaccinating your miniature snot factory. That's good. <laughs> I enjoy not having polio. Wow. I guess I should get that one, right? <laughs> you can play with me. I'm measles free. That's good. These are really good. Yeah. You're in good hands. I washed mine. Nice. Thank you for that. And, and I just wanted to remark that the previous two emailers talked about walking their dog yeah. <laughs> while listening, right? That's a thing. <laughs> Too bad the, the dogs are not getting educated. All right. Well, uh, we don't let, know that. <laughs> Maybe the people are talking to the dogs, right? Yeah. Maybe. Okay, let's do some picks here. Brianne, what have you got for us this week? I have an article that I read and I was just really amused by this article. Um, and I thought it went along with some of our discussions of space. Um, so this article uh, is about the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, which they note is so large that it actually cannot be uh, moved by air. Um, so we were talking about moving uh, the shuttles and things. Um, this is supposed to be the uh, telescope that is sort of the replacement for the Hubble. It's supposed to you know, be the next generation Hubble. And so they are hoping to finally be able to launch it uh, later this year. Um, but it cannot be moved by air. And so they have to move it on a ship. Um, and there have been all sorts of of delays and problems and things going wrong in putting this telescope together. And the uh, current worry is whether or not the ship will get attacked by pirates. <laughs> 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 and so th they are taught because there are, you know, all of these golds sections of the, the telescope and all, all sorts of really expensive parts of the telescope. And they don't want pirates to um, take the ship captive and hold it for ransom. Um, and so there is a whole part about how they are trying to protect this telescope from pirates while it is being shipped, as well as how other similar types of um, telescopes or instruments that were being uh, moved by ships um, actually were, in fact, um, held up by people uh, for ransom in the past. And sort of so, so there's some historical stories, but also kind of a little bit of discussion. They're very vague because they don't want the pirates to find out um, what the protections are. Uh, and it just really amused me to think about when I read this and I knew how yes. much everyone liked space. <laughs> Excellent. It's over $10 billion to yeah. build yeah. this telescope. Oh my gosh. That's worth stealing. Where are you, you going to sell this, you know? 
You, well, no, you'd you'd ransom it back to the oh, original people who you know who would obviously want it back. Um, well, I it mean, would you, be very very high risk. But. You just put guards yeah. on the ship, right? That's all you need to do. Well, have the, okay, so this is where people need to read one of my previous picks, The Outlaw uh, Ocean. Right, I remember um, that. Yeah, uh, yeah. So this is this is a real concern. Yeah, there are pirates yeah. out there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's so as you point out, Vincent, you know, it's worth ten billion dollars. Um, but I, so they also note somewhere else here um, that it's full of 18 gold plated mirrors. Right. And yeah. so even if even if you were not going to ransom it, there are quite a few uh, expensive parts. You could take it apart. Yeah. Yeah. Now, where, where is this where is this going to be launched? Um, it is launched, I believe, in the southern Atlantic. Um, I'm uh, double French checking. Guiana. Right. French okay, Guiana yeah. and South French America. Guiana. Oh, so is this going to be uh, launched by the Ariane, the, the French uh, space thing, or the European Consortium, I guess? Um, it's, it, NASA has made it. Oh, okay. Uh, but we don't have rockets to do that, do we? I don't think so. I don't know. Yeah. I think the I Ariane, remember, remember the Ariane, yeah. the big payload rocket? Yeah. I think yeah. that, that may be used because that sounds like that's where they would launch it from. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Well, wow. and they, I mean, the launch location is because they want something equatorial because then mm -hmm. you get better, better acceleration. But it's going to go where? It's not. Is it going in orbit around up. the Earth? No, uh, I know it's no. going up, but is oh. it going to be? Is it going to be in orbit, <laughs> or is it going to go beyond? Is it going to no, go? No, it's going to go beyond, similar to what Hubble did. Yeah, so where is Hubble? Is it some kind of orbit around the Sun? Is that right? I'm asking you things you no, probably don't. No, I think don't it's. Know. I think it's geostationary, I, isn't it, or something Hubble? like that? It's in orbit. Okay. But it's I, in think a very it's high in, I think it's in Earth orbit. Yeah. Okay. I think. That's pretty cool, Brian. <laughs> Who would I tell? Uh, it just amused me so much that it I is. thought I, this had to be. Yeah, I agree. I yeah. agree with it. That's very cool. Alan, what do you have for us? Um, I have a uh, a site that you you'll either look at it, and say, "Eh, that's neat," and then click away, or you will be completely drawn into this and just keep clicking around for. I don't know how long. I this thing fascinates me because I'm into radio, um, but um, you know, one of the so so what it does is you you sign on. It's called Radio Garden. Uh, you don't you don't have to log in or anything. Just as soon as you go there, if your browser has any idea of your location, it will um, it'll show a globe and then it'll zoom down and you'll see a bunch of little green dots. Those little green dots are radio stations that have uh, online presence, but they also broadcast, you know, on the airwaves. So it'll, it'll zoom down and give you audio from a local radio station. But the cool thing is you can then rotate that globe anywhere and pick another green dot oh. and listen to some other radio station anywhere. So you can go up into Arctic Canada and, you know, down into Chile or over to the South Pacific to places you, you never even thought about, oh, gee, there's a radio station there, but there's a radio station there. You can listen to what they're playing on the air right now. And it could be music or spoken word or anything. It could be, right? it could be anything. It could be in the local language. It could be, it could be classic rock. It, and, and this and, is, and, Alan, because the all stations now are internet-based, is that right? Most, yeah. Pretty much any station that's on the air is going to have an internet feed. And so they've collated all these. Um, and, you know, sometimes you'll often get an FM station, but frequently you'll get um, mm -hmm. uh, AM stations as well. Cool. And just wow. tune in the world, which, of course, I like to do with an actual radio as yeah, well yeah, and, yeah. you know, get the whole experience. But here you can just sit at your browser and tune That's around. That's pretty neat. Now, what have you heard so far? Anything interesting? Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I tuned across Canada and into Russia and down in, you know, through Asia. And you you hear different, um, as I say, you know, you, you never know what you're going to get. You, big metro areas, you usually get something that's like contemporary music and that's pretty similar yeah. around the world although there are local differences but then the, I, I like going to the really really obscure places where there's like one station in in hundreds of square miles and you tune in and they're you know talking about how the crops are doing or something there are no radio stations in antarctica are there uh well there's certainly ham radio activity there let me um the ham radio doesn't show up on this right no no um let me scroll down to 
Oh, I've got it on Anadir, Russia right now. Um, <laughs> let me just scroll down to Antarctica and see if I can get something. It's brilliant. Just brilliant. I yeah, love what people I, I do. I am going to play around with this a lot later. <laughs> it's just amazing. First thing yeah. that came, first thing that came to mind when, well, second thing after I finished with Austin was Wolfman Jack. Problem is you'd yes. have to, it won't find somebody from the grave, right? Oh yeah. Here's this. I was, uh, because he used to broadcast from like the southern border of California or something like that. Let me see. Oh yeah. Chula Vista, yeah, no, it's California. Not gonna, this is not archived stuff. There are other sites that yeah. have archived recordings, um, including right. one that I think I had as a pick. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not finding cool. an actual Antarctic station right now. I've got uh, a folk station in New Zealand tuned in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I see. There's none in uh, in Antarctica. Yeah, there but no yeah, green you can. Dots. You can spin Oops. around to any inhabited place, pretty much. I can go to New Zealand. That could be interesting, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Here's a big one. Let's turn that. One hundred seven. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's it's Christchurch, New Zealand. They're playing the same rock you would hear up here. Yeah. Yeah, the big cities are going to have pretty much <laughs> yeah, the same stuff. That's very cool. Yes, one could spend some time with this, couldn't one? Yes, one yep. certainly <laughs> could. <laughs> Rich, what do you have for us? So this is kind of a follow up to Dixon's pick from last week. Dixon had a graph that he had um, ripped from the New York Times that showed the uh, essentially the case fatality rate in different countries and made the observation uh, that in a lot of countries in Asia, there was a very low case fatality rate, uh, whereas other countries like in Europe and uh, North America had very high case fatality rates from COVID. And, you know, the question was why? Well, there was a follow-up uh, in the same feed, I think, I get this uh, daily feed from the New York Times that's a news summary from David Leonhardt. And uh, beyond that, I can't find an article for this. You have to look at this Leonhardt feed and pan down till you find this one little uh, article and a graph. And he said several people, when he posted that original graph, wrote into him and said, you know, uh, you ought to look at uh, ob uh, whether there's a correlation with obesity. Okay, and so now he presents a graph that uh, graphs obesity versus deaths. And sure enough, um, there looks to be, I'd like to see a mathematical analysis of this, but a correlation that looks like it could very well uh, be consistent with the graph that he published uh, previously. That in the U.S., Mexico, Britain, Brazil, Italy, uh, South Africa, Canada, where... Um, the uh, obesity rate is fairly high. You have uh, fairly high case fatality rates. And in India and Nigeria, Malaysia, uh, where the obesity rates are lower, you have uh, lower case fatality rates. I even uh, emailed this to uh, Stacy Schultz-Cherry because this is her bag, right? And yeah. she said, mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> so um, what is it about uh, obesity that does this? Uh, I'd have to look up Stacy's email. I'm not quite sure. There's an explanation in this article that has to do uh, with the uh, sort of the uh, crossover between obesity and respiratory problems. Um, but yeah. uh, I, I can't detail it. Yeah, Stacy um, had data at the last ASV, if I remember correctly, or someone from her lab about respiratory virus infection um, and obesity, um, that was really interesting data. Um, I remember so, being very but, impressed but by we it. Don't, we don't know the mechanism. Is that correct? I I think that there was some hints of mechanism in that talk. Yeah, yeah. And I think that I don't remember July that well. <laughs> what, uh, Brianne, what's... Um, now, obesity is an inflammatory disease, right? There is uh -huh. excess inflammation, yes. What's What about the... What, is obese tissue devoid of immune cells or what? No. So there are differences in uh, regulatory T cells um, mm -hmm. and their ability to act um, in obese tissue. Um, and some of the lipids that are seen also can stimulate the innate immune response. 
I see. Hmm. And I would add that obesity also correlates with um, a bunch of other comorbidities that have also been shown to be risk factors for COVID-19, uh, such as heart disease, diabetes, um, high blood pressure, mm -hmm. yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Got and, it. And, and in addition, um, people who are obese tend to have kind of less great health access. Um, many times they don't go to the doctor as often, perhaps because their doctor isn't super nice about, <laughs> um, you know, things like that. And so there also are sort of other ways where there are healthcare issues um, in obese individuals. And this is also something that um, correlates with systematic um, biases in health. So you see yep. higher rates of obesity among African Americans. You see it among, um, it, it tracks with poverty. Um, it tracks with, you know, a bunch of other things that also put people at higher risk of everything. Got it. So this could also Pretty interesting. be part of the, um, uh, the, the, the income issue that Dixon talked about, right? Right. Yeah. That could all be related. Yeah. Well, intertwined. Uh, you want us to scroll down to the COVID mystery? Oh, yeah. So the in this, when you click oh. on Rich's link, you get a um, an article that does not have this graph right at the top. You have I to see. scroll down to the follow-up part, and right. that's okay. where the graph is. Got it. All right. All right. My, my uh, pick is a website called <laughs> Concord Aerospace. The reason I know this is because it popped up on my Instagram one day with a picture of a switch, and I really am into switches. I'm, I when I was a kid, I loved. I don't know if you remember, but these toggle switches that are you know you can put in a panel and flip them up and down, and they're single pole and double pole and single pole double throw and double pole double throw. I was just so into those, and these are switches. They had a picture of a switch, so I came here, and you know on space on the spaceships they have certain switches, so you don't bump them accidentally. They have little uh, guides on the sides, yeah. right? And so that's what they're selling here. You know, space shuttle flight deck panel, power trim. They're, these look like functional switches <laughs> on the back. You could actually use them for something. I thought they Rich are would like this. functional switches. Yeah. I thought Rich would I, like this. There's yeah, actually so. some great. information on the back of some of these, uh, like the Apollo 13 command module, hydrogen, oxygen fans, quad switch panel. Maybe that's part of what burned up or there. Um, so all kinds of cool switches. And, and you can get custom ones. You can get custom ones. And I like... The one called off and definitely off. <laughs> it's red. I think that's really cool. Um, it says 2020. You can turn it off or, or definitely, definitely off. off. Oh, yeah. yes. It's 2020. That's good. Then there's a chemtrails one on or off. Yes. Yeah. I thought that was pretty funny. If you go um, all there's the, the Jewish the space bottom, laser. The, yes. Jewish space laser. But they Two also have, to from. you can buy like complete cockpits. Concord yeah. Airspace supplies a large number of real aircraft cockpits to our clients. So you could buy a cockpit. It looks like that's a 747 cockpit that they have there. Yes, Vincent, when you set up your podcast studio, you ought to have them come in and customize it. <laughs> yes. Real avionics. Alan, what's an avionics? Shit, stuff you use it, in an airplane? Instru instruments in an airplane. So when you see the panel of the airplane and their their different screens or screens these days, but um, in many of the planes I fly, <laughs> these little round gauges, um, those are avionics. Okay, here's what I need. A flight deck seating for the studio, right? They, yes. have, an actual, need, yeah. they have an actual pilot's chair. But you need a complete panel, yeah. Very cool stuff here. Um, anyway, I mean, I can afford the switch maybe, but... <laughs> Some of them are sold out. I'm sure. I'm sure their panels are. Uh, the switches are like sixty, seventy bucks, which which I could swing for a couple of things. I, I might have some novel uses for these, but I'm sure the panels are considerably more expensive. There's <laughs> one to activate the Jewish space laser. Yes, right. If you uh, drill down into the Jewish space laser, they have a uh, little wrap on the history. It's hilarious. Of the Jewish space laser. That is hilarious. First iteration was developed in complete secrecy around 1446 BC by the Israelites of Egypt in collaboration with space aliens from planet Zbornak 5, et cetera. <laughs> and it goes on. And this is a reference to a, a politician who famously has gone off on this particular conspiracy theory. Right. And yeah. 
anyway, these you could customize it to whatever you want. And, they, they, you know, they're industrial looking, right? So they have nice screws and the switch is cool and stuff. So, yeah, this but, could be part of a studio. That, that would make sense, right? And read the reviews on the Jewish space laser. I especially like the, the <laughs> second one. It says there, I'm a, I'm a, as a secular Jew, I prefer to do my lasing on Saturdays, but this will technically work, but only in Gentile <laughs> mode, which of course is inferior. That is awesome. All right. That is TWIV731, microbe.tv slash TWIV for the show notes. Questions and comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us, TWIV. No, microbe.tv slash contribute. Brian Barker's at Drew University Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Rich Condit, Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Fair enough. Always a good time. Alan Doves at alandove.com, Alan Dove on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thanks. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.